want to welcome you, especially if you're a guest with us today or maybe you're here uh, for the first time. What a joy it is for you to join the family room, the living room of our church. And uh, today we're entering into the fifth and final kind of subject of this series, Happily Ever After. The most anticipated, expensive, celebrated day of an adult life is the day they get married. They're surrounded by friends, men and women. They're showered by gifts. They're dressed in clothes they'll never wear again. (laughs) But they're lifted up by hopes and prayers. And it's all centered around a single promise. From this day forward, for better or worse, richer or poorer, sickness and health, to love and to cherish. Say it with me. As long as we both shall live. And then a marriage is born. I've had a chance to stand in this very space where covenantal vows are taken. And to be a part of that moment when a marriage is born. When a marriage dies, there are no pictures. There are no toasts. There's no gifts. There's no parties. When a marriage dies, it doesn't happen in a single day. It dies from a thousand little wounds that go unchecked and unhealed until hearts that were once soft and tender and open become hard and calloused towards one another. When a marriage dies, it's one of the most saddest and painful things in all the world. So friends, I'm really earnest about this message this morning and I'm going to ask your permission. We're going to go a little bit long because we want to end well with a a sermon that we need to hear, we need to consider this morning for our whole family of faith. Some of you are here this morning and you've already been through the agony of divorce. And I hope and pray so much that you'll find some healing in our time this morning. I pray that you'll walk out of this service and you'll have some insights and hope that lead to healing. I'm going to share four movements at the end of this service that uh, are going to be for you specifically. But then there are some here who are married. Maybe you're doing well. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you've been thinking about this topic. Maybe there's just a little voice in the back of your head that has always considered that divorce is an option. And I pray that this morning you'll walk out with some conviction about the Lord's teaching on this matter and that you'll walk out hand in hand with your spouse, with your Lord, and that you'll hold on to some tools that will guard against And maybe build up the gift that is marriage. And that you'll have some answers to these questions. I think are of ultimate importance for those of us who want and are struggling to live into our marriage. Is first of all, how can divorce be prevented? And the second is, how can we get on the solution side of a thriving marriage? A weighty task for the next 25 minutes. Agreed? So let's enter in. We're going to turn to the scriptures. We just heard from Malachi where we read this statement. Very harsh. The Lord says, I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. And I hate a man's covering himself with violence as with a garment, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. We're going to to do that this morning. We're going to guard ourselves. Because God makes his attitude on divorce really clear. He equates it with an act of violence on the marriage and family. And there's a general principle for all of us in this room that that we need to understand about God. And that is that God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God with you and me. That's the cornerstone God that we worship. And God takes his promises really seriously. When he joins in the covenantal vows of marriage in a space like this, where two become one by the power of the Holy Spirit, he takes that very seriously. But the Bible also discusses how we're to approach, how we're to handle divorce. I want to invite you to open your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 19, where we're going to see a very interesting encounter with Jesus and the Pharisees. This is going to require some context, so let me do some teaching, and then I want to get into some practicals. But uh, we're going to start with verse 1, and we'll jump into it, and I'm going to break it up and and give some uh, teaching in between some of these verses. Verse 1, it says this, 
When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee, went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him. So that's the scene. And as he healed them there, some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? He pulled of that for any and every reason. We're going to come back to that. Okay, a little bit of, of deeper context of what's going on here, okay? A lot of times we look at the passages like this and we do quick reads. We don't understand its context in the whole. But uh, the ruler of the people in that day, if you know the culture context, was a man by the name of Herod, okay? Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas had a brother named Philip. And if you want to enter into the first uh, Jerry Springer show, this is it, okay? <laughs> Herod seduces his brother's wife, Herodias, I know that's strange. Herod, Herodias, persuaded her to leave his own brother and to marry him. Okay? Thanksgivings were awesome in this house, right? No, it's really dysfunctional. And if you go back to chapter 14, you have a little bit more context. And that John the Baptist, who was this great prophet and teacher in that time, he had come to reveal who the Lord was. Well, he was vocally against this divorce that was public in front of all the people. And so he was uh, enemy number one to Herod. And so what happens to John because he's so vocal? Well, John end, ends up getting his head served on a platter, you remember? One of the most vivid and violent scenes in all of the Gospels in Matthew chapter 14. So when the Pharisees come to challenge Jesus in front of the crowds about the same question to which John the Baptist was put to death. What do you think their motive was? They were trying to trap Jesus. Very devious trap. They're thinking, you know, we're going to catch Jesus openly against Herod. And he too will die like John the Baptist. Interestingly enough, you'd think uh, the disciples would say, Jesus, this is time to be diplomatic, right? Let's play it safe. Let's give the non-answer, but sounds like an answer, right? But Jesus doesn't do that. He's going to tell some really difficult truths about marriage and divorce. So here we go. You ready? Jesus goes all the way back to the original intention for the human race. Verse 4. Haven't you read? He replied. That at the beginning the creator made them male and female. And said for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become what? One flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Jesus goes all the way back to the original intention, the mission of marriage. This is a reference to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, the beautiful picture that, that one flesh is possible. This requires mystery. But one flesh, he says, is a reflection of the triune God. The two shall become one, one flesh, just like the oneness of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And in that one flesh of man and woman, they will take on one of the most powerful attributes of their creator. One of the most significant attributes of marriage and one flesh. That is, that they can procreate. That part of God's creative intent is for us to have children of our own that bear our image, just like we're image bearers to the Father. That they themselves can be image bearers of the one who is born image in them. This is not just about sex. It's not just about procreation. It's about oneness of heart and spirit and mind. Oneness in helping each other live lives that are full. A life of commitment. And resolve to face life together. It is this mystery that two shall become one that we live in when we talk about marriage. That's God's intent. But there's a problem. There's this little issue of our fallenness. And this is where the issue of divorce is going to come in. Jesus diagnoses it precisely. Check what he says. Verse 7. When they said, why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts 
were hard. He actually corrects them because their original translation of Deuteronomy 24 never says the word command. It says permit. And Jesus is saying to them, it was because you were so hard-hearted that Moses permitted, didn't command, permitted for divorce. Jesus is referring back to the Hebrew scriptures, Deuteronomy 24. And the key word here in this passage and in these words of Jesus is this phrase, hardness of heart in the Greek, okay? We, uh, we just translate it simply because your hearts were hard. But it's interesting, and, and I don't want to get nerdy here, but, but uh, the Greek, the original word here is this, it's a single compound word made of the Greek for heart, cardia, like cardiac arrest, uh, and the word uh, scl- sclero, sclero. You get the word sclerosis from this. It's an image of when something dries up and hardens like oatmeal left in the pan for the, another day on the stovetop, right? No longer edible, no longer soft, but hard. What, what was once flexible and tender and open and healthy has now become inflexible and unhealthy. This is a problem, of course, in our marriages. This is a primary problem that causes marriages to deteriorate. Jesus says it's hard-heartedness. I want to take a time out and just get practical for a few minutes uh, and teach of some of the research that we learn a lot in our pastoral roles as we do marriage counseling. I'm a bit of a student of the research that's done by Gottman Marriage Institute. Some of you may be familiar because it's in our region. Dr. John Gottman is a researcher at the University of Washington and developed something called the Love Lab, where they observe couples in a little apartment and observe healthy and also dysfunctional behavior. We talked several weeks ago about something that they learned, which was that marriages that thrive are ones who do small things what? Often. Small things often. Well, hard-heartedness in their research and their observations is the result of the opposite. It's negative small things often. And what they found is that certain negative communication styles are so lethal to a relationship that Gottman calls them marriages four horsemen of the apocalypse. Four horsemen of hard-heartedness. And when these four horses ride together, it is very serious. Let me unpack these because when they observed couples in the love lab, in this uh, setting, they can predict with over 90% accuracy the failure of a marriage if the behavior isn't changed. The first sign of hard-heartedness, the first horseman of the apocalypse is criticism. Criticism. Criticism attacks the character of your partner. Over time, criticism uh, erodes trust and intimacy, especially when we start cataloging our criticisms and use them at the choice time to go after our partner. The second horseman is contempt. Contempt is an expression of superiority that comes out as uh, behaviors of of sarcasm or communication of sarcasm, cynicism, name-calling, mocking, or humor that's intended to hurt. I can tell you this, that uh, contempt is never acceptable from a Jesus person in any facet of our lives. Contempt and superiority is at odds with the humility-driven life that Jesus calls us to. And interestingly enough, uh, they found that the greatest predictor of relationship failure is this very attribute, contempt. And it has to be eliminated. Gottman says it's sulfuric acid to a relationship. Isn't that an interesting phrase? So the second one is contempt. First we have criticisms, then we have contempt. The third horseman is defensiveness. Defensiveness is self-protection through righteous indignation and playing the victim. And the problem is defensiveness never solves any of the issues in a marriage. It's really just an underhanded way of blaming your partner. Lastly, and I'll move through these quickly, is, is stonewalling. Stonewalling occurs when, uh, when one of the partners just feels that there's no chance to resolve anything, so why even bother? It's a sense of futility, and so uh, the partner doesn't even want to engage in the conflict and just stonewalls. What they find is that in every divorce, these horsemen are present. And what's awful is that most people are unaware that they engage in them at all. 
Now, here this is a word of hope. Hard hearts can become soft. Hard hearts can become soft. The, the four horsemen of the apocalypse can be disarmed. They can lose their power. And here are the antidotes, uh, antidotes according to research. If this is something that speaks to you this morning. Ways to soften your heart. For criticism, it is crucial that you talk about your feelings using I statements and then a positive need. So instead of, you always leave the dishwasher full. You never empty the dishes. I can't stand that you're lazy. It would be, it helps me so much when you empty the dishwasher. Could you please help me today? It's a reversal of criticism to encouragement to the need. And it puts me in the place of uh, encouraging my partner. You do that over time, small things often. That is the best way to turn the corner on criticism. Second one is contempt. Of course, it's in, important to avoid contempt as much as possible. And fortunately, there is an antidote, they say in their research, to contempt. And that is to build fondness and appreciation for your partner by remembering their positive qualities. When's the last time, for those of us who are married, when's the last time that you sat down and, and made a catalog of all the things that you appreciate about your spouse? There's a friend here in our church who uh, messaged me uh, uh, just a little story about a woman who changed this aspect of her relationship drastically by praying for her partner. And every day she prayed just prayers of gratitude. By the way, if you don't pray as a couple, that's a beautiful way to start prayer life together is just to take a moment at the end of your day or at a meal and just pray to the Lord. I'm so grateful for my husband and the things he does. I'm so grateful for my wife and the things she does. It's just to practice gratefulness. And what that does is that cultivate. In this story, I love this. This woman prayed for her husband day after day after day. And what she started to realize is that her heart started to soften. And she started to love him and develop fondness that previously she hadn't because she could not encourage and appreciate the gift that he brought. But once she did in prayer, everything changed. This doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. But it's the heart of every healthy marriage. A third antidote for the horseman in defensiveness is uh, to take responsibility even if your part of the conflict is small. Take responsibility even if only for part of the conflict. Communicating responsibility always honors your partner's feelings and opens up to what are the next steps we can take together. Lastly, stonewalling. I want to move past this, but this is just some practical stuff for us. The antidote to stonewalling is to take a break. And to come back to a conversation after you calm down and you can actually constructively engage in the conversation. Okay, that's a little bit of practice. I promised you every single Sunday we were going to talk about some practical things. I hope you were able to write them down. That's just a little bit of practice. Now, what I would ask you to do is instead of saying, yeah, my, my husband has that one and that one and that one and that one. Right? Yeah. These are mirror exercises. Your job is to take care of you, which is to look in the mirror and say, this is where I fall. You may even catch yourself this week that you subtly crit- criticize your partner and you don't even realize you're doing it. Okay? So your job is to look in the mirror and to think about how am I contributing toward these, towards these patterns. Okay? That is a, a key for healthy marriage. So back to our text. Okay? Jesus mentions hard-heartedness. We just talked about some of the ways that hard-heartedness enters into our relationships. And you can imagine the scene again. All these people, they're waiting. What is Jesus going to say? And Jesus points back to God's design. Not a shocker. They know the Hebrew scriptures, right? But then he continues, and Matthew adds this little section. Ooh, here it comes. But it was not this way from the beginning, Jesus says. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Wow. That's pretty harsh, right? We got a lot of folks in this room who've had second, maybe even third marriages. Jesus is saying we're adulterers if we do that. I want to I wanna just give you a context that's so crucial for this. Because we know Jesus was about grace. His encounter with the woman at the well. His encounter with the woman who was caught in adultery. We know he was full of mercy and grace. Why so harsh? Well, I'll tell you. Because he knows exactly what the Pharisees are trying to trap him in. 
See, in that day, there was a, there was a battle over the interpretation of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 24. We won't get into the, the aspects of it, but basically, it was that there was uh, this word objectionable in the passage in uh, Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. And it was basically said that if a husband divorces his wife because, because he finds something objectionable about her, well, then uh, he could just leave the wife. And in that day, that would just leave this, these women to just a horrendous uh, a lot in life, right? And so the dispute in Jesus' day was, what does that mean? What constitutes being objectionable uh, or indecent uh, if you're a wife? And so there were two schools of thought, two different groups of Pharisees. Not that we have any idea about two different groups of life who argue incessantly about how to do certain things in our culture, right? But these two rabbinic schools debated constantly about this. One was called the School of Shimei, and this was the real strict school. And they said that the only grounds for divorce, something objectionable or indecent, was sexual immorality. Adultery alone was the only grounds for divorce. And the second one was the School of Hillel, and they were really loose on this. The religious leaders who followed that school said things like, if a wife burns her husband's dinner, he can divorce her. No, no joke. Actually, that's not funny because they actually said that. Like, that's how ridiculous it was. Which school do you think most men who wanted to get out of marriage is identified with? Right? So Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I'm not going to get trapped into this debate of the two different schools. Jesus' heart is always for healing. So he says, if any of you divorce his wife except for sexual immorality, he is identifying with one. And marries another woman, commits adultery. He's calling people out who are abusing the scriptures, who are abusing the law. Jesus' mercy in his heart was for these broken lives, broken marriages. You need to know that Jesus' heart is always about healing. He wants us to heal. To live into a right relationship. To live into the gift that God has for us in marriage and what marriage means for us. Now, I want to speak to, because I know our community is so good at reaching and ministering to those who've been through divorce. And I want to speak to you just for a moment. And I said I'd end with some things uh, about healing. And I want to talk about what moves you towards healing. And this is kind of a crash course in what we do in our ministry called Divorce Recovery. If you want to go about the work of healing that Jesus calls us to when it comes to your marriage or after your divorce, the first one is this, is you're going to have to let go of the past. Especially if you've gone through divorce, you're going to have to let go of the past. Uh, there's a, a reality here in, in that we really have a hard time letting go of the past. A funny story about a guy who falls over the side of a cliff. He's plunging down. He reaches out, and there's one branch sticking out of this cliff, and he grabs a hold of it, and amazingly, it holds him. But he's in a lot of trouble. He's dangling there, and as loud as he can, he says, Is anybody up there? And a voice responds, Yes. Yes, I'm here. The man says, That's wonderful. Who are you? God. He says, God? Okay, what should I do? And the voice says, let go of the branch. And the man says, is there anybody else up there? (laughs) Letting go is one of the hardest things to do in the world. Because when you let go, it brings you face to face with what you most fear. It brings you face to face with reality. It brings you face to face with your situation. Maybe you desperately wanted the marriage to continue, but your spouse didn't. And he or she is gone now, perhaps even remarried. You find yourself desperately clinging to the past. And you'll have to let go of the belief that everything will come back to the way it used to be. You've got to let it go, and that's so hard. And the second thing you'll have to do if you want to live into healing, and for those of us who want to encourage others to live into healing, is to accept responsibility. This is so crucial. You have to accept responsibility. One of the ironic phrases that the legal system has introduced in our day is the phrase, the no-fault divorce. You know how many no-fault divorces there really are? 
zero. There's no such thing as a no-fault marriage. Just like there's no such thing as a no-fault divorce. Having to take responsibility for my junk is just something that every couple has to do, not just those who are divorced. It's something for all of us. Because every marriage is made up of two people who are broken and messed up and at times hard-hearted. I know for sure that I'm a sinful, messed up, stubborn person. I know for sure my wife is married to one. You're kind of wondering how I was going to handle that, right? I'll let her say what she needs to say. Friends, whatever things your ex-spouse has done, and there may be a lot of them, and they may be really bad, there were ways that you contributed to the death of your marriage. If it has died, there were. And too often what happens is people want to skip looking at this so they can jump into the next relationship as a way of avoiding pain. This came up in our podcast a couple weeks back, but this is an axiom that is so true and we must understand it, each of us. And it is this, your past effectively processed is the greatest gift you bring into your relationships. Your past poorly processed is the greatest detriment you bring to your relationships. Do you understand that? That your past matters. You've got to process through it if you want to work towards healing and not repeat things. Third, if you want to move towards healing, you're going to have to learn to forgive. You're going to have to learn to forgive. To learn how to forgive, the act of letting go and letting go of your right to hurt someone who has hurt you is a key task for healing. Divorce will bring you to a crisis of forgiveness like nothing else in the world. Dr. Judith Walterstein has done some landmark research in the area of divorce. Some of you are familiar with her writing uh, because uh, she's recently, in the last uh, 15 years, has done some landmark uh, research. She did a longitudinal study of divorce couples that spanned 10 years. And this is amazing to me. Listen to what she says. She says, Incredibly, one half of the women and one third of the men are still intensely angry at their former spouses despite the passage of 10 years. Because their feelings have not changed, anger has become an ongoing and sometimes dominant presence in their children's lives as well. It will take time. It will have to be done over and over again. You'll think that it's done, and then you'll realize there are still pockets of resentment there, and you have to forgive again. But eventually, you're going to have to let go of your desire to hurt that person back or to imprison yourself. So that's the third one, is you're going to have to learn to forgive. And then number four, if you want to move towards healing, you'll need to walk closely with God one day at a time. In every situation I've counseled where folks are entering into divorce or have just completed divorce or trying to recover from divorce, it is a deeply spiritual experience. Divorce will affect your spiritual life. Divorce will either drive you closer to God or farther away. Often people want to run from the Lord. And it will drive you to your knees in mercy for God, or it will drive you to despair. Now, as we've seen, the Bible is clear that God hates divorce, but the Bible is also clear that God loves divorced people. God loves all people, and that includes divorced people. Divorce is not the unforgivable sin that sometimes society and sometimes even the church talks as if it were. It is not. And I want to close with this word of hope, and we're going to Enter that conversation now in our circles of small groups and other places for this subject. But know this. Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive sinful human beings. And that includes me. And that includes every single person in this room. Nobody in this room is so good that the cross is unnecessary for you. And nobody in this room is so bad that the cross is insufficient for you. Agreed? So whatever your story... Live into the healing that Christ offers. Live into the truth and promises that God offers in his scripture around the gift of marriage. And may we as a community be a place where there is no smug 
entitlement, no smug righteousness, but instead we're healers in this journey of marriage and relationships. Will you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for your words in Scripture this morning that you call us to God's good intent. You hold us accountable to your intent. And you offer healing. I pray for each of us to live into the qualities that help us keep our hearts soft. That we would work at our marriages and for those that have experienced divorce, that we would work at healing. God, would you receive our presence this morning as an, a heartfelt desire to experience your hand in our lives. Would you walk with us hand in hand today and every day that we walk with you, that we can experience your favor and your blessings, we ask. I pray for every divorced person, past or present in this room, that they would experience your healing and anointing, that they would grow in wisdom, that they would grow in self-awareness, and that they would heal and do the work of healing. I pray for every marriage in this room, Lord, that you would give them power and encouragement. Would you help them to turn the tide of the four horsemen, disarm them with words of encouragement and love and empathy? Would you give us uh, the heart of a student to learn ever more what it means to be in healthy marriages, to live into the oneness that you have and you give to us in yourself, Father, Son, and Spirit, I pray. And I pray this in your name. And everyone said... Amen.